Welcome to the Refs Need Love To podcast, a show that gives you a real, raw, and behind-the-scenes view of one of the hardest jobs on the pitch, the referee. I'm your host, David Gerson, a grassroots referee with seven years of experience and over 1,000 matches under my belt. You can find me at refsneedlove2.com and on TikTok. In today's episode, we'll be reviewing a key match decisions I was involved with in just one high school match this week. Knowing the laws of the game is key at any level at any time. Also, I'm going to go over a few current events that made me think and I wanted to discuss with you. Okay, let's talk about my high school match this week. About a 45-minute drive from my house, and this was a great crew I was working with. Uh, One gentleman I had seen ref a high-level match that my son was involved in a few weeks ago, and I had a lot of respect for, so I was excited to work with him. And another ref was my first mentor as a grassroots referee. Uh, He's got about 10 years on me and loves the game as much as I love the game. So it was an absolute joy to spend time seeing him again and working with him. Uh, I feel that this network of referees that I've developed over the last eight years is part of my friend group, uh, to be honest. I don't necessarily hang out with them on the weekends per se aside from repping um, but you know when I see them you know it's hugs it's handshakes it's high fives it's oh my gosh I'm so excited to see you and we really do share a laugh and a smile and I was thrilled to have an opportunity to work with him because I knew I would learn something there's no doubt he's on his way to becoming a um, certified assessor he's already been a certified mentor so it's been great to get to work with him again okay So let's talk about some of the things that I learned this week. So in the second game, I I ref the first game, I was the center, but in the second game, I was the AR2. So I didn't see this happening, Um, but the coach of the uh, one of the teams was pumping up the balls while the match had already kicked off. So center's working the game in the field, I'm AR1, I'm on the line, and my AR2, my, my friend who's really experienced ref, saw the uh, coach across from him pumping up the balls and he called the center over and the the coach is like yelling at him is like oh you know don't make this all about you I was just pumping up the balls no big deal and so you know the the center referee talks with um, the AR and center goes to tell the coach hey coach you know we've already inspected the balls please don't touch the balls again he's like all right whatever and I didn't think another thing of it I mean what's the big deal he was pumping up the balls probably making sure they're properly inflated or you know maybe he felt one that was underinflated. Turns out at halftime, he had pumped up the balls so much, one of the balls was at 15 PSI. And and if you don't know what that means, the maximum on the ball is 13. And a number of the leagues specify a PSI of 12. He was turning these balls into little cannonballs. Okay, I mean, dangerous. You could hurt someone. They're also very difficult for a goalie to catch. And his team was going to dominate this game and have almost all of the shots on goal. That is messed up. Now, that coach should have received a yellow card, you know, at a minimum. But we didn't think about it at the time. The center referee had not experienced it before. I had not experienced it before. What's the big deal? Guys, never let coaches touch the balls or pump up the balls after you've already checked for proper inflation at the beginning of the game. So a little bit of a learning right there. A couple other things of note in this game. Had to give a a yellow card to a coach for earrings. That's right. One of his players came onto the field not properly equipped. It was so great. She came on. She had white tape on both ears. And I go, oh, are you wearing earrings? She's like, no, it's tape. I'm like, "Uh, what's underneath the tape? Uh, Earrings. Okay, follow me. (laughs) And so (laughs) took her, you know, showed her off the field and gave a yellow card to the coach for a player not properly equipped. Now, the interesting thing about this coach is... This is only, I don't know, seven minutes into the game that I, I, I noticed this. Or maybe it was a little longer. I'm not sure. But, you know, in, in the first five minutes, he had some offside call that he was, you know, giving my AR some lip about. And my AR immediately was like, hey, coach, you know, I'm in perfect position. You don't need to be saying anything about that. And then um, a couple of minutes after that, there was a uh, foul that I gave to his team and he was hoping for advantage. Now, mind you, the ball had gone kind of diagonally over to the touchline. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really was not a great uh, place to give advantage and it was kind of in the middle of the field. And so I'm like, coach, cut it out. 
you are engaging in public dissent. If you continue, there will be consequences. And then not a minute later, I noticed these earrings. And so I gave him a yellow card for, for that. But he was getting a yellow card probably no matter what. But so happened, he, the yellow card for the uh, improper uh, equipment, I didn't hear from the rest of the game. So good stuff there. Um, third thing that was interesting in this game is I had a deliberate trick to circumvent the laws uh, called on a defender. Uh, so I was the AR1, and I'm tracking back. And again, this is why we always track back and make sure we're in a perfect position, even if you think nothing much is going to come of it. Um, defender is dribbling uh, back towards goal. All of a sudden, one of the attackers starts to press. He senses the guy is coming, and he's inside his own penalty area right at the top of the 18. And instead of just giving a ball on the ground for his goalkeeper to play with his feet, he literally... Um, you know, lofts the ball up, kicks the ball up on his own with his foot to his head and heads the ball back to the keeper who picks it up with his hands. And I was right there and I just, I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> so I put my flag up and gave it a little waggle and very clearly, you know, made kind of a demonstration to the referee as to what happened. You know, I pointed for, you know, the, the foul going for the attacking team. And so, yeah, it was a deliberate trick to circumvent the laws. And this, I, I mean, I tell you, the kid was like, dumbfounded he's like what I've never heard that before the coaches were like what are you calling and I explained to them even at halftime I had a parent in the sideline in the stands very nicely just asked me what is it that you called and so I had to explain it to them and so I think this is just a great example of you know really being familiar with the laws of the game not only so that you can make the right call but so you can explain the right call you know high school Oftentimes, it's about education and participation more than it is competition. And don't get me wrong, this player was a wonderful player. Um, you know, I actually had played on my son's team a number of years ago. But still, uh, it's helpful if you know the laws of the game so you can explain it to people and they can understand the no for next time. It also gives you credibility as a referee. Uh, the last thing of interest in this game, which I think is really important, and again, uh, needing to know the laws of the game is specifically a uh, what constitutes a deliberate play uh, for a defender in determining if a an attacker has received the ball and has committed an offside offense. So what we're talking about here is attack is coming up the field and they play a ball to a um, a player in an offside position, but the defender you know, makes contact with the ball. And in this case, it really was truly a deflection. I think she might have gotten megged or, you know, just barely came off the inside of her, her leg as the ball was being hit pretty hard past her. And so player was in an offside position and we called them offside. They received the ball uh, from an, in an offside position to gain advantage from that. And so the attackers were like, wait, the defender played the ball. It's like, no, <laughs> that was a deflection, but it was not a deliberate play. And so... We really need to understand, well, what does that mean and what criteria do we use uh, these days to describe a deliberate play? So a deliberate play in the laws of the game is passing a ball to a teammate. So let's say that a defender um, is passing the ball to their goalkeeper and an attacker is in an offside position, receives the ball from that deliberate pass and scores. No problem. It was passed by, you know... Um, a, a teammate. Now, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm messing up the, the laws here. Deliberate play. <laughs> Again, yeah. So passing the ball to a teammate. Um, you have control of the ball. So you've got possession of the ball and time. Um, or you're clearing the ball. Again, these are things that a defender can do. So they've, they're actually clearing the ball by kicking it or heading it. And it's going the direction they want it to go. So this is really important. It doesn't matter if the pass to a teammate, you know, by a defender was, uh, you know, accurate uh, or unsuccessful. It doesn't negate the fact that they deliberately played the ball. Okay. But that is not a deflection. Okay. A ball blasted at someone that hits off their chest or hits off their foot, or they react and lift their foot a little bit and it deflects past them. That is not a deliberate play. It's when you have control of the ball and you've past it, you know, you've got possession of the ball at your feet maybe, or you've cleared the ball very intentionally. So some of the criteria that uh, IFAB has given us to uh, determine if a player was in control of the ball and as a result deliberately played it, it has 
It has the ball that came to it, did it travel from a long distance? And they had clear view of it. So they had time to see the ball and move their body and get in good position. Um, was the ball not moving quickly? So was it like lofted relatively slowly? Was it rolling slowly or was it blasted at them? Um, the direction of the ball was not unexpected. So again, did they see it coming at them? Um, did the player have time to coordinate their body movement, right? So it wasn't a, a case of instinctive stretching or jumping. So let's say a player is standing in a wall, okay, on a, def- on a free kick, and the ball is blasted at them, and they're jumping up to kind of, you know, head the ball, you know, as you know, to try and block their goal. That's not a deliberate play. Uh, that's reactive, completely reactive. And then again, if a ball is on the ground, it's easier to play than a ball in the air. So those are all different considerations for whether or not it's a deliberate play. And it's, again, really important to be able to have those committed to memory so that we can have a conversation with players on the field or coaches who are screaming, that's not offside, she touched the ball. Yeah, but it was not a deliberate play of the ball. And so I I had to explain that to a coach uh, during the game. So again, just good examples of stuff right there. Um, Some other things that I messed up (laughs) in the game, (laughs) it's really not a big deal. But, um, you know, in club, especially at MLS Next, you know, I am really making sure that on substitutions, you know, call it out, stay right there. They're staying at uh, the midway point and I'm waiting for players to come all the way off the pitch before I bring anyone on, really doing it by the book. Well, in uh, high school, um, it's not a thing. Uh, players cannot refuse to come off the pitch. So there's no risk to allowing other players to come onto the pitch and someone to go off as long as you keep an eye on and making sure you got you know the right amount of players on the field. Someone can come on onto the field as a player is coming off. So I just thought that was interesting. The other thing is a few years ago in high school, there used to be a rule that players had to come off at half field over by the benches. Now they can go off at any sideline, just like in IFAB um, games. So, you know, just like my club game. So, I mean, there's just always, you know, something that you can learn. I will tell you, if you are humble and you are open to feedback, you will always pick up something new. Um, People will share things with you and you'll get things. If you are just like, you know, I know everything already. I don't need to learn anything new. Trust me. You will not (laughs) learn and you will not progress. You will not move forward. It is always important to be open to learning. You know, whether you are 25 or you are 95, the day you get old, the day you become irrelevant is the day that you stop learning. So that was all. That was just one night in high school refing, and it was fun. I really appreciated working with those peeps and everything worked out wonderful. All right. So two current events that I wanted to uh, discuss today. Um, First off is a study that I saw last week online uh, that there was, and and I'm really shocked that it hasn't gotten more news, uh, but there was a scientific study done that proved that black players or players with dark skin are called for fouls and carded more often than white players or Caucasian players, players with lighter skin. Um, This is disturbing. Uh, You know, here in the United States, uh, I I have a number of of very dear friends who are black and they have dealt with, you know, situations of driving while black or literally standing and hanging out while black. Uh, They are definitely targeted, uh, you know, whether consciously or unconsciously, uh, by law enforcement officials, and uh, are you know pulled over more often, questioned more often uh, than their white or Caucasian <coughs> counterparts. Um, I have seen it. <laughs> I have uh, been with people and experienced it. Uh, it happens. It definitely does. Uh, there are unknown biases or, or maybe undetected biases and stereotypes uh, that we all deal with. Uh, I was, I'm going to be real transparent here. I was in a, a barbershop, uh, about two months ago and, uh, this barbershop's on, you know, different, you know, part of town from the suburb that I live in. Um, but I really want a barbershop experience when I get my haircut, I love it. And so this is more of an urban joint and I go in there and there's a you know, dude who came in after me, young man. Um, and I made a judgment, you know, when I saw him, um, 
you know, probably, you know, what his gig is, right? You know, so he's a young, I don't know, young 20s or older teen, whatnot. And, you know, I don't know. You just look at someone, you kind of make, you know, judgments as to what they may do or what they may be, you know, into in life, whatnot. And he sits in the chair next to me and he's talking to the barber or whatnot. Um, and I, I, you know, again, what is this guy? Probably, you know, in my mind, I, I make some, you make some assumptions about what he does or what he doesn't do. And he sits there in the chair and then I hear him talking about him going to Georgia Tech uh, getting his degree in like some type of really amazing engineering and all these, you know, co-op experiences he's got now and like all these things that I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm that guy. You know, I made a judgment based on the way this kid was dressed, you know, and, um, you know, where he was and I made assumptions and shame on me, shame on me. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's really important that, you know, as a referee on the soccer pitch, uh, that, you know, we are conscious uh, that there are stereotypes and biases. Um, one thing that was really interesting in this scientific study is, you know, it, when you talk about the scientific study, the first thing people say is, oh, well, maybe those players come from leagues where the, you know, the players are more aggressive or the fouls are more aggressive. Well, they controlled for that. And they looked at all of these fouls. And for the same exact offense, it was more likely that a black player was going to get carded than a white player. And just this week, uh, there was a game. There was a, an El Clasico between uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona. And Frankie de Jong, you know, who was not playing the ball, who was committing a very cynical foul against Vinicius, you know, with both arms around him. Uh, Vinicius is trying to play the ball. Um, but at the end of it, Vinicius's arm was up, you know, over Frankie's shoulders. Um, Frankie's arms were completely wrapped around Vinicius. Vinicius has nowhere to go. And they both go to ground. And Vinicius received, um, black player received a yellow card. And Frankie had no sanction. No yellow card. No foul. And so... It just made me pause and think. It's like, you know, even at the highest level of games, and this was specifically, uh, this study was done in Syria, in Italy. Um, there were no fans there. So the, the, this was during COVID time that they did this study because they didn't want the fans to be in, or the, the referees to be influenced by the fans. Um, you know, that they did this study. And it just really made me think that this is, this is maybe happening more than we know it. And so I ask you as, as fellow referees just to be thoughtful um, just to be conscious, just to really be thinking about um, making sure that you're being fair um, and consistent with your fouls. And then if someone is, you know, a black player or someone of different skin or a different ethnicity than maybe you are, that you take pause and you just make sure that you're treating everyone the same. Would, you know, would you give that a card to that player if they were of a different background or ethnicity? Are you being lenient on a player because they're of a similar ethnicity to you? Um, I, 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 you know, I hope we are treating everyone the same. I hope I, you know, really go out of my way to treat everyone uh, the same. Um, but I just wanted to make mention to that. It's concerning. It's out there. Um, you know, the more we know, you know, the better we can be. Um, the last thing I wanted to discuss this week uh, was about Lee Mason. Um, now, I've let this die down over a couple of weeks. I was, you know, a little well, pretty upset when I first found out about this, but uh, Lee Mason was a, a VAR official in England. He was a pro referee for many years um, at the English top flight, and there was a parting of the ways uh, soon after uh, the Arsenal-Nottingham Forest game where um, they were investigating a foul in the lead-up to uh, the actual goal, and um, there were like three or four headers on this goal, or three or four different touches on this goal, um, right in the area of the 18 yard, um, you know, the 18 yard box. And so they did not wind up drawing the lines on one of the uh, headers that wound up uh, contributing to the goal. And, and this was a key match decision. It was missed. Um, it certainly wasn't caught by anyone during the game. The commentators during the game, no one mentioned it there. But after the game. Um, because Arsenal is top of the league and this, you know, determines the outcome of the league. Um, it was found that one of the players uh, was judged to be just barely in an offside position when coming back um, to make a header on the ball and the build up to a goal. And so, 
And there was a statement by PG, uh, uh, the Professional Referees Association in England, that there was a mistake, uh, that the lines had not been drawn on that specific play, um, and the goal should not have counted. And that Lee Mason, the VR official on that game, um, was leaving um, by mutual, quote unquote, dis- a mutual consent. Uh, we all know that means he was asked to leave. Um, and uh, really, probably for Lee, felt really hung out to dry and not supported. I mean, it's a mistake, there's no doubt, but we all make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Players make mistakes all the time that cost team games. Coaches make mistakes all the time that cost, cost teams games. Do they get fired? Now, coaches, yeah, if they do it over and over and over again, yeah, they get fired too. Um, but I think we hold referees to unrealistic standards. I mean, they are not robots. I mean, we even saw at the World Cup, man, the robots even need to be coached by humans as well. (laughs) You know, they're not perfect. They need some guidance because the game moves fast. You know, it is really hard uh, to see every single thing every single time. Um, And they do not have the benefit of, you know, hours in a studio looking at every possible angle and getting all of this fan video that might get sent in um, after the game. That's not what the VAR has. I mean, they got to make decisions crazy fast. You know, they have to figure, you know, do I have something within the next 15 to 30 seconds? Otherwise, they got to go on. Um, you know, the, the VAR, again, the Referees Association has said they do not want, you know, VAR to be determining the outcome of the match. They'd love it to be determined on the field. I mean, yes, it's there for, you know, clear and obvious errors, but they want it to keep flowing. You know, I guarantee if, you know, VAR had hours to be able to look at every possible angle, you know, on every single call, maybe they would get, you know, 99.9% of the things right. But when you only have, you know, 15 to 30 seconds to spot something and then another minute to really be able to get the best possible angle to make a clear call on it, I don't think you can be perfect. And I, I think we are just holding refs to unrealistic standards. And I think about this ref, you know, Lee Mason. Um, if you are a professional referee, I mean, this is your life, man. Uh, it, it's not like all of a sudden now Lee is going to be able to go ref in Vietnam or Thailand. You know, he doesn't probably doesn't speak the language, um, you know, or, or Germany, the Bundesliga. He's probably at the tail end of his, his career if, you, if you've refed already in the Premier League and now you've made it as a VAR official, um, you know. I, I hope he can support his family. Uh, most of those pro refs or VAR officials are around my age or younger. Um, they may have young kids. Uh, do they have a, a second job they can go to? Uh, can they afford to pay their mortgage next week? Um, you know, thankfully they live in a, a developed country that actually has health insurance. You know, so I don't have to worry about health insurance. You know, but what does he do next? Where does he go? Uh, you know, if you think, oh, well, maybe he'll go get a job at his county FA, you know, his football association. Well, do you think that pays enough to live on? <laughs> no. Uh, so I, I think about, you know, the, the lifetime of sacrifice that this man has made to become a referee. And I'm talking sacrifice. I'm talking thousands of matches on sloppy, wet pitches, you know, all across England, working his way um, up the pyramid, up the leagues to get to to the Premier League, um, and then, you know, again, you know, move from refing on the field to VAR, and then really gets dishonorably discharged very publicly. Um, you know, if he made a mistake, could he have gone into some other role for a period of time, you know, maybe just quietly, you know, over the summertime, maybe just parted ways or something like that? I don't know. But I felt it was, you know, really hanging him out to dry. It is a outrageously hard job. Uh, that very few people have any appreciation for. Um, and I, I feel bad for him. And, and, I, and I really think that, you know, the Referees Association in England needs to do a better job supporting their refs and helping everyone understand how difficult that job is and not trying to pretend like they're going to be perfect all the time because they're simply just not, just not what it can be. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's pod. Um, I think being a referee, especially a grassroots ref, can be lonely sometimes. And as we've seen as a professional ref, it can be you know, precarious sometimes. Um, I, I, I really I, I value uh, the friendship that I have made with other referees and the com- camaraderie that I have with other refs. And I would be totally shattered if that was quickly taken away from, from me. 
Um, well, I hope that this podcast, you know, brings you a little bit of joy if you're a referee, you feel closer to another referee out there, um, and it, it gives you a little bit of a sense of support and community. Uh, if you like today's pod, please check out my website and merch at refsneedlove2.com. Please show your support, and as always, I hope your next game is red card free.